Thank you, Richard. I uh, want to thank the uh, meeting organizers for inviting me uh, to speak today. Uh, I want to thank the previous speakers because of their clarity and choice of uh, um, topics that will certainly make my talk uh, more intelligible. And finally, I want to thank the patients for their interest in these diseases and their participation in our research. So, okay, essential thrombocythemia, pathogenesis and management. Um, I do consult for insight, transparency. Uh, and I just want to start with a little background here that has been touched upon by Richard and um, some of the other speakers that um, these are not easy diseases to understand. They're uncommon, and few physicians see many of them or many of any one of them. They have diverse clinical manifestations that evolve over time. These are not static disorders. Stem cells change their behavior, and um, this can be very confusing. Because they all share um, activation of the JAK-STAT pathway, they mimic each other. They mimic other clonal disorders. Uh, such as certain types of MDS. They mimic non-clonal disorders, such as just uh, benign erythrocytoses, because they share the same pathways, which activate normal pathways in hematopoiesis. So this is a, the bizarre thing of you have malignant cells that look normal because they're being driven through normal pathways. There's no specific diagnostic test for any of them. Their natural history is not completely defined because there is no specific diagnostic test for each of them. And so different physicians will describe these diseases differently. Serge has talked about um, the use of this new inhibitor, uh, or actually back to imatelstat, and he'd get a wonderful response. But do those patients have true primary myelofibrosis? They don't have splenomegaly, uh, which 80 to 90 percent of the patients have. They only have anemia, and they get better. Uh, on a drug that doesn't really hit, um, doesn't do what it's supposed to do in terms of being um, an inhibitor of telomerase. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, as you're going to see, the clinical perspectives about these disorders continue to be driven by unproved assumptions that are almost 50 years old, uh, which is a frustration to many of us. So we're going to talk about some statements about essential thrombocytosis, and it's a little game called facts or myths. So we have a new WHO criteria, 2007, uh, that this is the way we ought to be looking at whether a patient has essential thrombocytosis or not. Now, you've fortunately gotten the hematologic uh, glossary, so I will not spend any more time on this slide. It will be available to you. Um, and um, Bob Kralovich talked nicely about how you get clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and how you get clonal dominance. And transformation, unfortunately, is age-related. I used to wonder, why do you get young people with uh, myeloproliferative disorders and older people with myeloproliferative disorders? And uh, the answer is, it's random and it has to do with age. Uh, the next important point has to be that the uh, transformed stem cell, which only needs one driver mutation, as you've heard, um, will then outcompete the other stem cells. And then when you look in the bone marrow, you look at clonal burden, how many of those stem cells have the disease, which is something that is not often looked at in clinical trials. You will not find it. Um, fortunately, the normal stem cells are there. They are just being inhibited by the abnormal stem cells. Now, uh, age of... Um, uh, uh, Anne Mullally talked about this. Um, it's a very exciting stuff that uh, as you get older, you acquire mutations. This is random. Um, and the older you are, the more mutations that you will acquire. And that's why you see this big peak in acute leukemia in patients over the age of 60. I'm going to come back to that because this is true for anybody. It's not true for patients who just get myeloproliferative disorders. But the arrows here are to show you that some of the earliest acquired mutations are the mutations in JAK2. You can see this in a child being born. We'll have the JAK2 mutation, no one else in the family has it. Uh, why that occurs, we don't know, but it is reflected in a number of things. So to get back to what Bob was emphasizing, uh, you can have patient DNA alterations. These can be the acquisition of mutations, which may be familial, which may be just sort of bad luck, or the aging process, and that interacts with patient genome, 
And while we know about the mutations, we don't know about each genome, and Bob made a very um, cogent statements about that. And those two together will determine whether you get a disease or you don't get a disease. And as he said, just having the mutation doesn't mean you're going to have the disease. Uh, and this is important because we have these new panels. You can go to a number of places and buy a panel of genes. This is, gets back to, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to do well or not. Why don't I get a CAT scan of my whole body? And if it's normal, I'm sure I'm normal. Well, there are going to be so many false positives there that you're not going to be sure of anything. Uh, and the same thing with these gene panels. Uh, you may have a mutation that is meaningless, but now you're worried you got a mutation. What are you going to do about it? We don't know. So it's things to think about. Now, these are the uh, frequencies of the various mutations uh, um, overall. And you can see they vary for disease. Uh, so why does one patient have polycythemia vary another uh, primary myelofibrosis? We don't have that answer. But again, that's patient variation. Now, this is to show you some genetic and age variation. These are ages. Um, patients, uh, these are comes from uh, um, Allison Moloterno's um, Hopkins uh, 600. We follow a lot of patients there. And these are just the JAK2 V617 have positive ones. Uh, the blanks are the ET, the red is PV, and then PMF is gray, and acute leukemia um, is black. And, and you can see that uh, women get these diseases earlier than men. They get ET more than men. They get PV earlier than men. And then later on, you can see there's a biphasic uh, uh, curve with uh, ET, and PV goes up and then it falls off with age as the population falls off. Uh, you can see that PMF occurs later and more often in men, and acute leukemia occurs earlier than men and more often in men. Uh, so unless it's uh, therapy related, then it's equal. So you can see that gender and age have an impact on how diseases behave. Now, if a physician is con um, confronted with a patient with a high platelet count, this is what he or she has to work with, this differential diagnosis. So this is needle in a haystack type of stuff. Uh, and you can see there's lots of things that can be going on here. How do you get there? Well, if you're willing to listen, as Richard uh, has pointed out, in polycythemia vera, you only have erythrocytosis is the only thing that separates that. In primary myelofibrosis, well, they have fibrosis in the marrow, um, but, uh, Urklet, but you can have fibrosis with PV early on. doesn't mean anything. You've got it. So elevated CD34 positive cells in the blood um, is what we see there. And if someone comes in with an isolated high platelet count, you have nothing but that platelet count to work with and whatever mutations they may have. Now, I won't spend any time on this. It's just the, the World Health Organization says, you know what? And you look down here. We use the hematocrit or the hemoglobin to tell us whether you have uh, PV. And forget the red cell mass. And uh, So the French did not forget the red cell mass a few years back. And the bottom line here is they took patients with JAK2 V617 of positive ET and found out when they measured the absolute amount of red cells in their blood, that almost 65% of them had elevated red cell counts. Now, you'll have people out there who say, oh, well, that's because these diseases are a continuum. So we're going to get into that. So right away, the World Health Organization diagnostic criteria created mainly by pathologists uh, with no clinical validation are wrong. And I always like to bring up uh, Hans Christian Andersen um, when we really need him. So let's move on. So I think these, these uh, criteria are not correct. They're a myth. So how about a whole bunch of these? That ET and PV are really a continuum, and it doesn't matter how you treat them because you're going to treat them all the same, except that one disease has too many red cells and one disease doesn't. So we have a problem. So this is um, another study from our group. Um, and this has to do, again, with sex, disease duration, genotype, allele burden, and phenotype. And just I would just, um, I don't know, this pointer's not going to help much because not everyone's going to get it. But we have time on this axis and the number of cells that carry a mutation on this axis. And if it's less than 50%, cells only are carrying one. If it's greater than 50%, some of the cells are carrying two, one on each chromosome, as uh, uh, Robert Kalavik uh, and Joe Bercow showed many years ago, this unique 
what's called uniparental disomy, where you end up with homozygosity for JAK2, which is not a good thing in some senses. And what you see for ET, and the black and the white dots are male and female, is that most patients never get homozygosity. Their disease stays the same the whole course. So true ET, nothing much is going to happen to you because you cannot get clonal dominance. That's key. Now what about PV? Well, you can see some PV patients have the same clonal burden as the ET patients, and nothing's going to happen. How do you tell the difference between two of them? The World Health Organization can't help you. But most of them do get this uniparental disomy. They get homozygosity, and they have an increased allele burden. So if you have someone, if you have a high allele burden, and someone tells you you have ET, you ought to go back and tell them, think again. So let's move on. Now, are these diseases a continuum? So more women have ET than men. Um, they get it younger. They have less splenomegaly. Their allele burdens, as I've told you, are lower. In fact, some women with ET, the so-called uh, JAK2 V6 one set of negative, only have the mutation in their platelets. This is really interesting. Uh, and their neutrophil allele burdens are always lower than the men. Uh, they very rarely have clonal dominance. Right. So these diseases really can't be a continuum. Now, I want to just throw this up. This is a slide, similar to what Bob showed before, of mutations in ETPV and uh, PMF. And this is a very nice uh, whole exome sequencing every gene uh, and looking for mutations. And what you find out, if you get down past the um, JAK2 and the CALR, uh, you're going to find out that most ET patients don't have very many mutations. They're the least mutations of any of the groups, which is another good thing, because the more mutations you acquire, the more chance you have to get a clone that's really going to get out of control. Now, there's a problem there, but I'll get to that problem in a second. Um, if you look at CALR, ET, JAK2 ET against PV, all these diseases are dissimilar because it's all patient variation. Now, the problem with this, if you look where I have the red line under hemoglobin, you'll see hemoglobin of 17.6 at the upper range there for CALR mutated ET, and 17.7 for JAK2 mutated. Well, there's no woman on this planet that has a hemoglobin of 17 grams. Okay? The problem here is now, if we go back, how many of these patients actually have PV? So someone's done a very expensive study to say, these are the ET genes, these are the PV genes. They're mixed. And unfortunately, the, obviously, the reviewers uh, didn't pick this up. Um, this is a real problem. If I got on my hobby horse here, I was reading an article on uh, uh, the myeloproliferative disorders, and the statement was made, nobody who has a CALR mutation has polycythemia vera says it in the text, and if you look, at, it's not funny, if you look at the figures, there are four patients in their group. And I emailed the authors, and they said, well, you're right. <laughs> now, where were the reviewers? What were they reading? Uh, all right, let's move on. All right, so let's look at survival. These are three survival curves, ETPV and PMF, all right? A recent study, and if you look, they're not the same. And here they are if you're under 65, and you can see they're even longer. They're still not the same. So one wonders how these can be three diseases. I just throw this up to show you for, for your interest, the CALR and the JAK2. And for ET, they're pretty close. their survival curves. Um, the uh, PV falls under this, and of course, uh, PMF is uh, obviously has a inferior survival. But I would take all these with a big grain of salt because of how people are treated these days. So now we, I don't think these are a continuum. They're separate diseases. They need to be treated separately. Now we have a whole bunch of uh, questions that come up here. One is, is the platelet count correlated with thrombosis? Is the allele burden correlated with thrombosis? Is thrombosis a risk factor, thrombocytosis a risk factor for thrombosis? Extreme, over a million, what we call platelet millionaires. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just wonder if the Republicans have a trickle-down effect. I'm sorry. I'm going to continue. All right. The leukocyte count a risk factor. Is age a risk factor? Okay. So here's, here's the answer. Here's a platelet counts from 
three different uh, groups of platelet counts and the thromboses per 10 patient years, they're insignificant difference. So the platelet count is, doesn't have a correlation. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this except to say, um, look at this 2007. This is Dr. DeFerry who proves that leukocytosis didn't predict thrombosis in 2007. And, and if you look carefully, um, all these patients were had uh, high platelet count, high hemoglobins, and that was causing the thrombosis. Uh, he also uh, challenged the idea that low-risk CT patients with extreme thrombocytosis uh, should be treated, and if, in his series, if they were treated, uh, that didn't make a difference. Of course, the reason they, they all had, some of them were actually had polycythemia vera, as you can see from the hemoglobin values. What about age? So this is a small study, and there is no difference. There are about six studies out there that say if you're over 60 and you're under 60, the only difference is if you're over 60, you have a greater instance of getting acute leukemia because people over 60 have a greater instance of acute leukemia because they're older and they've acquired more mutations. So I don't treat my patients who are over 65 differently than I treat my patients who are under 65. And we're gonna to get to that in a second. So what I've gone through a whole bunch of things here, these are all myths, but people are being driven by these myths. So how about the last one here? Chemotherapy is an effective anticoagulant. I'm not sure where this came from. We don't treat uh, patients with a DVT who don't have a myeloproliferative disorder with hydroxyurea or busulfan or what have you. Um, so let's talk about treatment. So these are the potential complications of this disorder. Microvascular ischemia and migraine is, um, uh, one, one of the patients kindly came up to me and told me of her experience with severe uh, vertigo and um, headaches and, and got a big workup and uh, was and said, you know what, you got migraine. Uh, and I would say this, uh, more women get ET than men. And women who have migraine, when they get ET, if you don't lower that platelet count, that migraine is not going anywhere. That this is one big problem in this disease. And I've had actually put patients on interferon to get them clear up their migraine. All right, thrombosis, and you can see this whole list of things. And this looks pretty severe. Hemorrhage, because if your platelet count goes up, platelets are like little sponges. And if your platelet count goes up high enough, they will pick up a particular clotting factor and destroy it. If the platelet count gets lower, they don't do that. So platelet counts uh, up over a million and a half, so we'll, you'll get that problem. You don't usually bleed with it unless you have surgery but it's something you need to know about. And then of course, there's a transferation to myelofibrosis or acute leukemia. So this is what happens in the small vessels. Platelet gets sticky. They may damage the endothelium. You may get uh, digital ischemia. You may get severe headaches. You may get uh, visual symptoms. Um, so this is uh, transient. Now let's say, let's look at vascular events by gender, we have 164 women, 106 men. And let's look at the uh, DVTs, who's getting them? The PV patients, not the ET patients. Who's getting the abdominal venous thrombosis? The PV patients, the, not the ET patients. And notice who's getting them, the women, not the men. Um, hepatic vein thrombosis is the way polycythemia vera presents in women and the hematocrit will not be elevated because their, red, their plasma volume is so expanded, but the platelet count may be up and people say, it's the platelets. It's always the hematocrit. Uh, so you can see PV is the culprit here. Not. So let's look at arterial events. And if you look at, again, on the females and the males, who's having them? The PV patients. Who's having the minor events? And that's the uh, migraines and the erythromyalgia, uh, transient ischemic attacks. Generally more the women, not the men. Uh, and um, when you get down to, I shouldn't say mi minor events, when you get down to microvascular events, that's an equal opportunity employer because of high platelet counts in both. So what happens when you give chemotherapy to a myeloproliferative disorder patient? We know this best in polycythemia vera. Nothing good. Their survival isn't better, and their prevention of death is, or thrombosis is not better, and that was in 1995. And you think we've learned anything, you would be mistaken. Now, the reason we're in trouble is because in 2005, the New England Journal published this article. I was a reviewer. I never got a reply to my, and my statistician's comments. And they said, 
hydroxyurea versus anegrelon. If you look there, you say, oh my God, 17 thromboses in the hydroxyurea group versus 37. This is a slaughter, but it's not. Because if you look at heart attack, unstable angina, stroke, they're not different. What's different are transient ischemic attacks, which are not a thrombosis, except in this paper. And in Negroli, there were 14, and hydroxyurea, there was one. So what's the story there? Well, hydroxyurea makes platelets very slippery, and Negroli doesn't. So it's like a big aspirin, except it's more toxic than a big aspirin. And so, yes, that's arterial. But look at venous thromboses. Hydroxyurea was totally ineffective. So we have a problem there, but everyone forgot that. That's called an inconvenient truth. If you go down to another study in ET this time, um, ET was very good. Hydroxyurea really worked against transient ischemic attacks, but there was stroke and myocardial infarction in this small study um, that was not, they were not, it wasn't different than aspirin. In other words, it doesn't prevent thromboses. It doesn't prevent arterial and doesn't prevent venous. It prevents, it makes your headache better. So finally, a study came out uh, from Dr. Gisler in Vienna. This study took a few years to be published because it was another inconvenient truth. Hydroxyurea was not more effective in this study than in agrolide because in this study, Dr. Gislinger uh, Gis and his colleagues made sure they were looking at ET and not PV, which was not true with the other study. So even though the white cell counts were lowered, there was no difference in uh, efficacy, so this again throws out the white cells. Okay, now, if, and this is a uh, Spanish study, it was wonderful, and they looked at thrombosis in hemorrhage and ET and found out that only smoking was a problem. Nothing else, age, gender, cardiovascular risk facts, and hemoglobin leukocytosis, nothing, okay? But they had more venous thrombosis in the JAK2 positive patients, not on any platelet therapy, and I suspect that there's a problem there with who's got polycythemia beer. So that was 2007, I showed you way back there. So here is the same people in 2007 said that, you know, um, you don't need to worry about the white cells, or you don't worry about the high platelets. Here's risk stratification in ET in 2007, and let's just jump down to the high risk, greater than 60. Low-dose aspirin and hydroxyurea, okay? And high risk, that's refractory. Well, you know, these patients, uh, if you really don't like them, give them busulfan, okay? <laughs> and probably because hydroxy didn't work, didn't work. What happens if you give patients hydroxyurea and then you give them busulfan? Or you give them busulfan and then you give them hydroxyurea, then you're gonna get into bone marrow problems that are gonna be only resolvable by uh, bone marrow transplant. That's what happens. Now, why do they do that? Well, here's the European Leukemia Net res Treatment Response Guidelines, and it tells you what a complete response is, a partial response, no response. That's 2011. What happened in 2013? Evan exists that these guidelines don't predict response or provide clinically relevant measures of benefit for patients, but we're still using them. Someone has to explain this to me, uh, and I'm still waiting. Okay, so now here's one of the people who is involved in this. And what does he say? And I, I left the names off to, there's no one in the room, but just to not to embarrass the guilty. Leukocytosis and the JAK2 mutational status and our mutational burden are under active investigation. And the theory that an elevated platelet count increases thrombosis risk is now challenged. This is 2011. This is 2015, this is from the same crowd. It's almost like they don't read what they're writing. Okay, and then the summary, leukocytosis and JAK2 mutation should be considered once more information is available and they've been validated in project, project, projected respective studies. It's never gonna happen. So everyone, did, William Damaschek is the saint, but does anyone listen to him? There's a tendency in medical practice by no, limited, no means limited to hematologists to treat almost any condition as vigorously as possible. In hematology, this consists in attempting to change an abnormal number, whether this number is hemoglobin, hematocrit, white cell count, or platelet count to get normal values, whether the patient needs it or not. So people have forgotten, they're gonna quote Damashek, the father, and then forget this is inconvenient. And for some of you in the audience, I, I get patients who come to see me, and they're on hydroxyurea, and they can't get a good dose because 
every time they get too much of the drug, they stop and the platelet count goes up. This is called cycling, hydroxyreinduced cycling. And uh, uh, the way you stop it is uh, stop the hydroxyurea. Or get down to one dose and don't panic, okay? Because there is no safe platelet count because there is no correlation of platelets with thrombosis, only with the microvascular, the headaches, and uh, what have you. So I'm sorry to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, uh, all these things that are in the literature are myths. And the management is if you're asymptomatic in our clinic, you don't get treated. Platelet counts of greater than a million. Uh, we look at the receipt. Well, so one of my patients with a platelet count of, of one million is going to surgery. So we're going to get a risk and cofactor activity that measures important coagulation factor. And if it's normal, they go to surgery. Uh, we can, can always control th uh, hemorrhage with a drug called Amicar. Um, aspirin is the treatment of choice for erythromyalgia unless the risk cofactor is low because aspirin makes the platelets dysfunctional. If you want to reduce the platelet count, under 60, an agrolide or interferon are preferable uh, unless there's cardiovascular disease. And the platelet count should only be lowered to the extent to alleviate symptoms or prevent bleeding. A normal, if you have a million nor, uh, crummy platelets or 400,000 crummy platelets, it, there's no difference. It's the same as if you had counterfeit money. Now, I just want to stop, end with uh, some thoughts here. Uh, pegylated interferon, as Richard so nicely talked about, works in both PB and ET, and uh, I, I, it's my drug of choice in younger women. Uh, we don't know enough about the durability, uh, and I, if I get what I want, I will stop and give them a holiday. Um, and it also works now in CalR positive, well, no, no surprise, uh, ET, uh, and will lower the allele burden, uh, while well, aspirin hydroxyurea will not. Uh, and this is Serge's work, and I uh, let him speak for it later on. Um, Ruxolitamid does work in these patients, and uh, it does alleviate um, their symptoms. So you, you're getting pretty much the same thing in ET as you get in PV, though uh, obviously the need is greater in PV. And I'm going to end with this because I would feel remiss if I didn't. And um, so this is the Imatel stat, the uh, uh, oligomer that's supposed to block or supposed to degrade. This thing is supposed to, it's an a reverse RNA which uh, signals degradation of the important messenger. It doesn't really inhibit telomerase. Um, no one's quite sure what it does, but it does something. And this is, it's given intravenously, so you have to take it every couple weeks and you cycle your platelet counts. Uh, and it brings the platelet count down and it brings the JAK2 mutation burden down. Uh, if you stop it, these things will recur, so it uh, isn't durable to that extent. Uh, it, uh, here's the allele burdens going down. And you have to watch out for allele burdens in ET. There's neutrophil allele burdens. They're usually low. And it's not really what you care about. You really care about what the CD34 positive cell is doing. But we're not going to get that kind of data here. But as I say, when you stop, these things come back. And you know, lowering from 25 to 10, that is pretty meaningless biologically. And remember, these drugs are not without their side effects. Uh, mostly they're mild. But um, one thing in this article, you see the transaminases are something to worry about on a long-term basis, uh, is that you can get significant neutropenia and anemia here. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, um, in a disease where you wouldn't get any of that, um, is this um, uh, going uh, a step too far? So with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention.